Bueno, y la, las preguntas, eh, eso luego. Ok, hello, uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this uh, uh, semi day, to this uh, conference bueno, with, las preguntas, with which eso, we inaugurate. Hello, uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the. Okay, so I'm Elias Cueto, the president of the Spanish Society for Numerical Methods in, in Engineering. It is uh, uh, my, my pleasure to welcome you for, uh, to this uh, day in which uh, we will have a very interesting talk by uh, uh, Professor Marcos La Torre. And uh, we will finish by having our annual general assembly of our uh, society. So let me begin by uh, introducing uh, Professor uh, Marcos La Torre, uh, our speaker today. You know that uh, uh, we have begun uh, uh, something that uh, we hope to, to, to become a tradition in our society, which is uh, to close the year with uh, the, a conference Uh, of uh, our award uh, with the Juan Carlos Simó Award, uh, in this case, uh, 2021, which is, as I said before, Marcos La Torre. Marcos La Torre is uh, Maria Zambrano Next Generation European Union Fellow at the Institute for Research and Innovation in Bioengineering of the Polytechnic University of Valencia. As a predoctoral student with uh, Professor uh, Francisco Javier Montans, who uh, you may know well at the Polytechnic University of Madrid, his research uh, focused on the development of uh, novel continuum and computational models for large uh, strain hyperelasticity, viscoelasticity, and elastoplasticity, which have since found different applications in engineering and the sciences. Uh, during his postdoctoral stay with Professor Jay Humphrey at Yale University, he moved into the field of uh, vascular solid biomechanics and mechanobiology, putting forth uh, new theoretical models for predicting vascular growth and remodeling in diseased uh, tissues, such as in fibrotic, aneurysmal, or tortuous arteries, as well as uh, efficient computational methods for the design of uh, tissue engineered vascular grafts with application to congenital health uh, disease. Uh, Dr. Marcos La Torres' current research, current research goal of, uh, at the University, uh, Polytechnic uh, University of uh, Valencia involves uh, developing a comprehensive understanding of how alterations in the mechanobiological response of the heart to electrophysiological disorders contribute uh, further to cardiac disease uh, development through closely interrelated uh, theoretical, computational, and experimental approaches in cardiac uh, tissue engineering. Well, needless to say that uh, Professor Marcos La Torre is uh, our 2021 uh, Juan Carlos Simo awardee, but he has also received uh, different uh, uh, awards and, and prizes, such as, for instance, the Klaus Jürgen Bathe Award in uh, 2018, if I'm not uh, wrong. So uh, the interest uh, of the of the talk uh, is uh, uh, out of uh, question, and uh, something uh, that uh, makes it uh, even more interesting is that uh, I think that Marcos has uh, intended the, the, the talk to be. Uh, a tribute to the to the work of uh, Juan Carlos Simó, uh, the person who who gave his name to this uh, to this award, and a prominent member of the Spanish uh, numerical methods community. So, Marcos, uh, it is uh, really our pleasure to welcome uh, you back to Spain from Yale, and uh, especially in this uh, special day for our uh, society. So, well, the floor or the screen is yours. Yeah, thanks Elias for a kind introduction. So thanks, Irene, so for, for this chance to 
show my research in such a broad way. First of all, just let me express that it is a true honor to receive the CIMO Award from the Spanish Society for Numerical Methods in, in Engineering. It is with great respect that I, I thank you. I also thank you the, the rest of the executive committee, especially the international judging panel that selected my name for, for this award. The award that acknowledges my research on computational mechanics and its applications as a young investigator. And as such, it, it represents a boost to, for my imminent independent career as a senior investigator, less young investigator. I'm saying this because today is my birthday. Uh, today I turn 58 years old. So exactly in a couple of years, I won't be considered uh, young anymore, right? At least in, in academic terms. So the timing uh, could not be better. So thank you very much for this award. Thank you for this birthday gift. So, and with this, I will start my presentation. So hello everyone, good afternoon. You are in Spain or Europe. Good morning or evening if you are in any other region in the world. Thank you for attending this CIMO talk, which I will give an overview of some of the research I have been doing over the past few years in collaboration with the groups of Professor Montans at UPM and Professor Humphrey at UPM. The, 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 the title of this presentation stems from the fact that it's been 10 years since I bought the first series of books to start a PhD in a field on which I had some previous knowledge, but that hadn't been my, my main focus in, in college. In fact, I'm an aerospace engineer that specialized in college in aircraft propulsion systems. I had taken some classes on continuum and structural mechanics, but uh, I had taken many more on fluid dynamics and aerodynamics especially in the last two to three years in college. Then I, after working in ITP for one year, it's a Spanish company that designs and manufactures turbines for reaction engines, I decided to make a comeback on one hand to academia and on the other hand to computational solid mechanics under the guidance of Professor Montanz at UPM. Yeah, so from, from my first books, one that uh, certainly stood out was Simon Hughes' uh, Computational Inelasticity, which had uh, keeps having a great influence in the way I think or do research. Such it was that influence that in some way I also dedicated my PhD to Simon. So this is an extract of the acknowledgements or agradecimientos in my thesis dissertation, which I defended four years later in 2015 from where I have translated a passage for you. Yeah, so I will always remember the first days of my PhD, in which I reached the second chapter of Simon's Computational Inelasticity book, where I saw some strange symbols representing certain operations that I could not fully understand. Now, after four years of hard work, continuous learning, I opened the book, I reread it, I understand it, and what is more important, I enjoy it from, from beginning to end. So you will understand now, 10 years after opening that book for the first time, what receiving this award means to me. So I would also like to pay tribute to Simon with this presentation, honoring some of his many influential contributions to the field. And uh, with this, So one had to submit three papers to be considered for this award, for which I decided to show novel contributions, leadership capabilities, and international collaboration. So I submitted one paper on computational viscoelasticity. That was the, the last one included in my PhD at UPM. Another on computational plasticity was part of Miguel Angel San PhD at UPM, who I supervised with Professor Montans. And a last one on computational growth and remodeling Published during, published during my postdoctoral stay at Yale with Professor Humphrey. So this slide also serves as mm, to show the contents of this presentation, which I have organized in these three different, but intimate, intimately related, as you will see, parts. I will focus mainly on evolution equations for inelastic solids, their full implicit algorithms for finite element analysis, and their applications in both engineering practice and the sciences. 
here, I promise, I have tried to use as few strange symbols <laughs> as possible, although I'm afraid that some of them are yet necessary to show the extent of these publications. With that, uh, uh, start the presentation. So we, let's uh, start with uh, computational viscoelasticity. This response is characteristic of rubber-like solids and soft biological tissues. It uh, manifests due to the slow changes in temporary connections of molecules with their neighbors under changes in stress. Characteristic responses are relaxation of stresses, grip of strains over, over time, stiffening and hysteresis that are rate dependent. So in this part of the presentation, I will revisit a couple of formulations and uh, I will explain how I could extend them. So in, in, in uh, chapter 10 of this book, Computational Elasticity, uh, Simo, there, there is a like, summary of uh, one formulation that he previously published in 1987. So this formulation is based on internal stresses, which we re will represent with Q here and is motivated from the standard viscoelastic solid, which has two branches. One is a, a hook branch with a spring and a Maxwell branch with a spring and a dashboard. Here, epsilon is strain, sigma stress, C are energy functions. This is an equilibrated branch, non-equilibrated branch. And this is the viscosity of the dashboard. By simple kinematics, the, the strain is simply elastic strain plus the viscous strain. I, by, by simple equilibrium stresses are just the sum of the equilibrated stress plus non-equilibrated stress. So here one can, for the small strains that I'm going to present here, uh, one need to propose the, the free energy of this device. And here, Simo, uh, with the main aim of, of extending this formulation to nonlinear behavior, or propose this energy that is, is not using these energy functions, but another one that is the initial energy. And here we can see also the in, internal st stress and another function that can be determined. So now, but simply from, from the dissipation equation that states that the mechanical power minus the rate of change of energy must be greater or, than zero or, or, or equal to zero, uh, we can obtain first the, first the stress from these parentheses. And you can see the stress is the initial stress minus this internal stress. And this stress is the one that will relax over time. Then the function G can be determined from equilibrium. But because this equilibrium, uh, this uh, question is not giving the evolution of the internal stress, one has to assume an evolution for, the, for this internal stress that will give the, the relaxation of stresses. So motivated from the linear case, he suggested this evolution equation for Q, where you can see here that this, this energy can be nonlinear. So it can depend nonlinearly on the strains. And here, gamma is uh, just a ratio between the, the different moduli here, and T is the relaxation time. Good thing of this formulation is that can be extended to finite strains quite easily. Here I'm only presenting uh, equations conceptually. But for, for the exact expressions of these equations, I will refer you to, to the original paper. But you can see that they are very similar. Here one can consider a volumetric deviatoric split, for example. But for those details, please refer to the paper. Uh, but the formulation is pretty similar to the one in, in infinitesimal strains. Here for finite strain, we use the right Cauchy green tensor C, the second viola Kirchhoff tensor S, and the internal stress tensor Q. And then we get the stresses again as initial stress minus the, the stress. So the advantage of this formulation, as I said, is that it can be used for nonlinear behavior and uh, also for anisotropic energy functions. The, the disadvantage is that being motivated from the linear case is uh, only valid for the small deviations from thermodynamical equilibrium. What does that mean? That means that this, if we think in terms of this device, it means that this strain can be large, here assuming large strains, of course, 
but this elastic internal strain can only be a small or moderate. So a change in total strain will be accommodated by a change in viscous strain, not elastic. So 11 years later, Risi and Gobingis developed another, or proposed another model. And here uh, I must say that Gobingi was uh, a student of, of uh, Simon. Uh, but they propose a model now based on internal strains. So in this case, the energy is expressed in terms of the strains of the springs, both the total strain and the elastic strain. With that, one can again, again determine the stress. This is also different to Simo's approach because uh, now the stress is the sum of both branches, both branches. And, and another difference is comes from the dissipation equation, because now the dissipation equation automatically uh, defines an evolution equation for the viscous strain, for this strain. Yeah, so let me show this with the pointer. So, and now this can also be considered as a constitutive equation of Newton type for viscosity, because the stress is proportional to the rate of change of the deformation. This uh, uh, formulation can also be extended to finite strains. But in this case, because the formulation is based on internal strains, uh, this uh, divides for infinitesimal strains can be generalized to finite strains using a multiplicative composition of the deformation gradient in terms of a viscous part and an elastic part. However, when one writes the dissipation equation for this case, situation is uh, rather, uh, it's more complicated. So you can see that this question is equivalent to this one, because we have here the, the derivative or the gradient, and we have here the, uh, the, the viscous velocity gradient that plays the role of this uh, rate of change of the, of the viscous strain. And indeed, proposing an evolution law from this dissipation equation is not simple. So in, Indeed, in that case, uh, Risi and Gobingi, what, what, did, what he, they did was to motivate it from a previous paper by Simon and Michi from 1992 in the field of elastoplasticity. So they restricted the formulation to isotropy. By restricting the formulation to isotropy, this tensor, which is the left green tensor, Cauchy green tensor, and the Kirchhoff tensor commute. This equation is simplified and one can uh, postulate this evolution equation for the elastic deformation. However, even in this paper from 1992 by Simon Michi, they already said that this evolution equation was non-conventional. And it's non-conventional because you can see here uh, one of these symbols, and this is the Lie derivative of the, 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 the this tensor B elastic. So already was deemed unconventional. So during the second part of, of my PhD, we wanted a model for viscoelasticity that could capture first an isotropic viscoelastic response, and second, that it was valid for large elastic deviations from thermodynamic equilibrium. Well, I didn't say that, but this model is restricted to isotropy, but you see that this, I haven't linearized anything here, so this is valid for large deviations from thermodynamic equilibrium, which means that this deformation gradient can be large, can be finite. So to do that, we, I, because uh, Christian Gobingi's uh, model is derived directly from thermodynamics, so I decided to try to extend this formulation to anisotropy. And to do that, I was inspired by Simon's book, in particular, section 3.5.2, where he performed an elastic plastic operator split, which is very well known uh, in terms of the algorithms or for numerical schemes, but he performed this operator split on the continuum theory for the continuum theory. So this, we have not discretized the equations here. So taking this, I came up with a, a concept that uh, turned out to be applicable both for small strains, small strain viscoelasticity, but also finite strain viscoelasticity. And I will explain, I can explain this concept to you just taking this uh, device as a reference. So here we have, imagine that we have an increase in a strain, right? 
is this total. And then we have an elastic predictor for which the plastic strain is fixed. However, here we have a viscous strain. So imagine that the viscous strain is fixed. For a change in total strain, there is a change in, in elastic strain, right? We are stretching from the right. And uh, yeah, so that is what is called the elastic predictor. However, many formulations, particularly in plasticity, as, as I will explain later, are based on a plastic corrector. What does that mean? That for once this has been stretched, then the total stretch is now fixed. And what we have is a plastic, in this case, viscous corrector. So there is an increase, a change in, in viscous strain. And that is what is called the plastic corrector. But however, what I thought is that for each change in viscous strain, there is a um, complementary change in, in elastic strain. And that is what I called the elastic corrector. So we can do that uh, more formally by simply assuming that, well, assuming not taking that the elastic strain depends on the total strain and the viscous strain. And then by simply application of the chain rule and partial derivatives, we get that the elastic strain in this spring equals an elastic predictor for which viscous strain is fixed, plus an elastic corrector for which the total strain is fixed. And this is an elastic corrector, not plastic corrector. Indeed, we can express this in terms of the viscous corrector. Sorry, I said plastic before, but it's, and then we see that this minus the change in viscous strain. So, but this is a mathematical concept. So this is valid for, for any function that depends on two variables or more, in this case, two variables. So if we take now the multiplicative decomposition or the deformation gradient or the seeder of decomposition, we see that depends on the, the deformation tensor and also the viscous gradient. So now we have a function of two, var or two variables. We can apply the same concept here. And you can see that we have here the change in, in viscous uh, deformation gradient but this can be expressed, and this is just notation, as an elastic corrector, and this will be the, the viscous corrector. So then we can operate analytically, and this is are the expressions that we get. Okay. I will come back to them. Okay. But this can be also applied to the tensor B elastic, which the Lie derivative of, uh, of which was deemed non-conventional, Simon B. In B. So this tensor, takes this form and the leader, the lead derivative is defined in this way. So you can see now that the lead derivative of B elastic is just the elastic corrector rate of the tensor B because the total deformation tensor is fixed. So what can we do with this? Why is this useful? So the dissipation equation that I showed before, you know that is expressed in terms of a viscous corrector rate. I have just shown in the previous slide that the viscous rate equals the, this, the symmetric part of this tensor, and this equals minus the elastic rate. So we can just rewrite this equation in terms of elastic uh, variables of elastic nature only, because this equals to this. So and another thing that we can see here is that we can now, I'm not able to relate here the dissipation to changes in energy. That is what, what we can understand, right? But we have here an elastic variable. We have here a viscous variable. However, if we use the elastic corrector, just this notation, we can see that this is, again, uh, the, the chain rule for differentiation. And then we can express this as just minus the change of energy in the non-equilibrium branch. What does that mean? That's, that's what we understand, right? That the, what is dissipated when this configuration is fixed is what is dissipated by the viscous dashpot is uh, precisely what the elastic spring loses, the, the energy that loses. Right? For that reason, we have designed the, the minus. Thing. So now we can postulate an evolution equation for the elastic deformation tensor in terms of the elastic corrector rate. And note that here I have not assumed isotropy. So this is general case. This is valid for an isotropy. And it is also valid for uh, 
large deviations from, from thermodynamic equilibrium. Now we have a theory that is written in terms of elastic predictor and elastic corrector rates. However, when we want to integrate this theory, is we one can use an elastic predictor corrector scheme, which is well known in, in, in for example, in plasticity. To integrate this theory, we decided to use logarithmic strains because that facilitates the, the integration greatly. And for that, we depart from this configuration. We uh, there is an, incre an increment in the total deformation gradient. For that, starting from there, we can assume that the, the viscous strain is uh, fixed. So we get the trial elastic deformation gradient, which will be this tensor. And then we can integrate again in the second correct pursuit step, uh, fixing the total, um, the total configuration and just integrating this equation now as a corrector pseudo step. And we can do that just with a simple backward Euler, Euler scheme, which provides a fully nonlinear update for the next step. And now, as I said before, this function can, this can be now nonlinear and valid for orthotropic or anisotropic response. And the same for the, for the viscosity tensor. But uh, due to some issues related to the intermediate configuration, we decided eventually to use a isotropy, an isotropy description of the, the fourth order viscosity tensor. One year later, we could extend the formulation using a reverse decomposition of the multiplicative deformation gradient, a multiplicative decomposition, but it was reversed with respect to the seeder of the composition. And in this case, we show that the formulation can be indeed very efficient. However, even if we have a formulation that is computationally very efficient, it will be useless if cannot describe experimental data well. So for, with this, we wanted to describe the behavior of soft tissues, which show, show both uh, direction-dependent elasticity, but also the direction-dependent viscosities or relaxation times. We can determine this from experimental tests. And for that, we used data collected by the groups of uh, Begoña Calvo and Estefania Peña at Zaragoza. And with that, we could, you can see that the, capture, the model captures quite well the elastic direction dependent elastic behavior, the direction dependent uh, viscous behavior in particular different, there are different relaxation times here. And in this paper, we could also extend the formulation to, to capture, to reproduce and to predict uh, initial stretch dependence that this, this type of materials show. Indeed, this is tested in the same direction for different stretches and you can see how the relaxation is, is different. Well, with uh, using the, once we have the model determined from experimental data, so we can you now with confidence perform um, simulations, computational simulations using finite elements. So here I'm showing just an academical example of a plate with a hole using an orthotropic material that is also has a viscoelastic response. Here, the preferred material directions are not aligned with the test direction. So when we stretch the material, sorry, and you, will, you will see it now. When we stretch it, we see an angular distortion. Here, another degree of freedom that we have is that these energies can be different. So if they are the same, you see that after this initial stretch, which involves large elastic strains, as you can see, uh, then the initial instantaneous distortion is pretty much the same as the final, finally relaxed distortion. So here we only see a relaxation of stresses. However, if, this, if the two energies are different, which is something that we can get from experiments, you see that the instantaneous uh, angular distortion is different from the final relaxed distor distortion. So here we see relaxation of not only stresses, which is the typical thing that we see relaxation of stress, but also relaxation of, uh, of the deformation. And finally, I show here the, the implementation 
provides asymptotically quadratic rates of convergence using a fully implicit implementation of the model. And with this, uh, I finish this part. Here are the references that I used. So you can come back later to see this video again and, and check them out if you, if you like. But here I, I would like to highlight this last one, which I have not commented in this first part. But this was a collaboration with uh, Chu Liu and Alison Marsden from Stanford. And in this paper, we could, as I said before, the CMOS formulation, the evolution equation, that is not derived from thermodynamics. So, and that has been criticized by some other researchers. So in this paper that we have just published uh, this year, uh, we explain how we can derive that formulation consistently from thermodynamics. So it's, it was very interesting collaboration with uh, people from Stanford. And with, with that, I move on to the second part of this presentation, which is computational electroplasticity. This behavior is now mostly characteristic of, of metals, but also reinforced rubber, biological tissues, importantly, way beyond the physiological loads, but also collagen networks. It can be explained by the presence of dislocations, which are defects in the crystal structure, which facilitate the plastic slip in particular planes and directions. Characteristic response, as uh, you may know, is that we have a permanent plastic deformation, right? We have also hardening, and in this case, it's rate-independent hysteresis. As before, I will review a few combinations or evolution equations and how we could extend or try to improve them. In this case, I'll go to chapter one in uh, this book, where Sim also starts developing the theory using small strains, which is the same thing that I'm going to do here today. Uh, in this case, uh, plasticity is motivated, can be motivated from single crystal plasticity. Uh, in that case, the uh, strains are well defined. So it is common to use our uh, formulation based on internal strains, not internal strains. That is what, what uh, everyone does, basically. So, but in this first chapter of computational elasticity, Simon motivates the theory starting from a rheological device, where now instead of a, a dashboard, what we have is a frictional device. Now we have plastic strain instead of rather than viscous. And we have a new parameter here, which is the it's kind of the yield stress. So that is what defines when plasticity starts. And for that, this is usually defined using a, a yield function, which I will show later. So here now, because this model is based on internal strains, now the energy is defined in terms of the elastic strain in the, the spring. The stress directly the differentiating the energy. And now from the dissipation, I'll compare this with the viscoelastic case that Simo used before, but, but for the dissipation, now we can obtain directly the flow rule. Okay, And it, this is a rate independent flow rule because now we have another parameter. This is not the same gamma before, but this is the common letter that is used. This defines the accumulated plastic strain in the dashboard, even if it's positive or it goes accumulating this plastic strain. And here, this, this is the gradient of the yield function, that is what defines the plastic response. And here, you can see that this dissipation is the same as. Uh, I showed before for the model by Christian Gorin. And now we can just integrate this using a predictor corrector algorithm. This has been done since the 70s. So, and then obtain the, the plastic strain, and with that, we can obtain the elastic strain. However, now we have an a incremental equation for the elastic strain, but depends on two variables. This is another difference with viscoelasticity. And these two variables, fortunately, we have another equation, which is the yield function, where we can enforce plastic consistency. So we have two equations for two variables. We can solve the next step. But note that Simo was working on this problem years before Risi and Govindy published the, the, visco, the visco elastic model. Uh, and this is what Simo said in his seminal paper from 1992. 
you say, as they stand, however, this evolution equation referring to the uh, infinitesimal case are not easily generalizable to the finite deformation regime. In particular, a debated issue concerns the specific rate form to be adopted for the left-hand side. Different objective rates and alternative measures of deformation lead to different, a different form of the evolution equation. So much of the controversy in the literature on finite deformation plasticity is related to this specific issue. So that is what I'm going to try to explain with this, with this uh, slide. Uh, this is the slide that is loaded with the with a num uh, number of questions. But to, to extend this to finite uh, strains, we take the multiplicative decomposition of the deformation gradient. And with that, we get the stresses from the strains again. And we, get the, we can get the dissipation equation, which I'm just showing here. Okay? I'm not developing all the, all the expressions of the theory. But what I want to highlight here is that first, that this, this takes the same form as the one I showed before for this plasticity. But now here we have a plastic velocity man. And what I want to highlight is that this is an originally symmetric equation or plastic corrector flow because this tensor is symmetric, this tensor is symmetric. So this is a six-dimensional equation. And here is where the, all the controversy comes, because what people have tried to do uh, since the 70s, 80s, is to try to get an evolution equation departing from this equation, but that getting an evolution equation for the plastic variable. But you can see that that cannot be done here easily. And that is what Simo was referring as the rate issue. This, uh, as I said, this is chronologically before than what I explained before for this plasticity. But here, what we can do is that to move this deformation, elastic deformation tensor from right to left, and this, this is precisely what the, defines the Mandel stress tensor. And this Mandel stress tensor for the general case of an anisotropy these two tensors do not commute. And if they don't commute, this tensor is generally non-symmetric. In the same way that this the plastic velocity gradient, we know that this tensor is also non-symmetric, of course. So then this can be split in two parts. One is the symmetric part and anti-symmetric, skew symmetric part. Again, this is plastic flow. But here is where another well-known tensor in the elastoplasticity community appears, which is the plastic spin. So note, interestingly here is that this equation, which is six dimensional, gives exactly the same dissipation that this one. So these are equations are equivalent, they give this exactly the same dissipation. However, here we can compute it using as only a six dimensional equation that is symmetric. Here we need two terms, the symmetric and the skew symmetric part. So here you, you can understand how this is was very where, where the controversy came from. Because now we can integrate the proposed this evolution or plastic flow rule and integrate it via an exponential mapping, and we get an incremental update for the plastic deformation gradient here. But however, you see we see now that we need the definition of the plastic spin that will come here within the, the exponential to be able to determine the plastic deformation gradient from which we can then uh, go to the next step, right? the, determine the elastic strength, that this, this strain or deformation will define the stress at that point. And so here there are many, many assumptions that give rise to many, many different formulation, as Simo already said in the quote that I, I said before. So now is when he and uh, Michi assumed isotropy, again, rewrite this equation in another way, but know that now this is written in terms of variables of elastic nature only. But, and from here, one can mm, propose this uh, plastic, flow rule, but in terms of elastic variables. But with this Simon uh, circumvented this rate issue, but only know that this is only valid for isotropy. 
Then Simon, the same year, integrated this using logarithmic strains. This was also one of the reasons why we use logarithmic strains for the viscous model, uh, because th they are additive, they facilitate the integration, and they can also reproduce the experiments pretty well. So how can we circumvent the rate issue in the more general case? So I finished my PhD in 2015, went to Yale 2017. So in between, I stayed at Yale University, I, sorry, UPM, and it was kind of my first short postdoc. And during that time, I was uh, supervising the thesis of Miguel Angel San, uh, along with Professor Montanz. And with, we thought that maybe that what we had done previously for viscoelasticity could be extended to plasticity. And indeed, as I said before, the expression for the dissipation, they are very similar. It's just that here we have the plastic the velocity gradient. And indeed, we can again use the definition of this elastic corrector uh, rate and write it again in terms of logarithmic strains, as Simo did. And this is how we can circumvent this rate issue that has, has been lingering around for, for many, many years. So the, the, the key thing to do is that we should integrate, we can integrate the originally symmetric elastic corrector recoil, I'm calling here a recoil because this is not a flow, right? We have plastic flow and then we have an elastic, it will be recoil. So instead of, instead of modifying this equation to get the plastic variable, we can directly integrate the original equation, which is the one that comes from dissipation directly. And that is what we, what we did using logarithmic strength. And now in the same way as we had for viscoelasticity, we have a continuum theory and algorithmic theory in, in parallel. That, and yeah, yeah, they are parallel. Also, Simon, in his paper from 1992, he said that the, this has another advantage, is that the, uh, both the closest point projection algorithm and the consistent algorithmic elastoplastic tangent remain unchanged with respect to the infinitesimal case. He did that for isotropy. Uh, my opinion, uh, we, we, we did that, in including an anisotropic behavior. So these are key properties of this new formulation that we developed in 2017, 2018. First is based on the multiplicative decomposition. The key aspect is that we use correct or elastic strain rates. The, very importantly, the Mandel stress tensor that has traditionally governed the dissipation equation is not present it's because we are working with the original equation. We are not modifying it or operating with it. Symmetric flow is uncoupled from the plastic spin. This was indeed postulated by Lubliner in 1986. It is six dimensional algorithmic update, fully symmetric, valid for an isotropic hyperelasticity, plasticity, and large elastic deformations, and also plastic flow is isochoric naturally. So it is a generalization of what Simo did in 1992, and for that reason, it particularizes to, to that formulation. So as I said, uh, this was part of the thesis of uh, Miguel Angel Sant. So this was implemented in, uh, th th these are simulations performed in the commercially available called Adina. We, first, we numerically validated the formulation. Then this is another academical example where we perform uh, the stretching of a plate, considering an isotropic elastoplasticity, kinematic and isotropic hardening. Uh, and then there are other many interesting applications that we can uh, compute with this formulation. If this is, we could validate it experimentally. You can see here, this is the earring profile for this cylindrical cup drawing using Hill's plasticity. You can see how we can predict or obtain this earring quite well compared to experience. So this is a good experimental validation. And finally, you can see here in this other simulation how for metal forming, how after the sheet is being deformed, right, formed, how there is an elastic retraction that is called the, the spring back, the spring back. So the model can also obtain these kind of behaviors which I think are important for, for engineering practice. 
And here I must say that I have the simulation well performed by Raul Diaz Gonzalez, who is a student of Miguel Angel San, who was my student. So I was uh, very satisfied when, when, when I saw these the results. I, I know that they are using this model and they are extending this model. But not only this, I'm also so very satisfied year after year when I see that uh, Professor Montanza and his group uh, publish papers uh, related to this and that are extending this formulation to new avenues that I, I, I couldn't imagine initially. And indeed, they, they could model cyclic plasticity using now this concept, but now they could show that nonlinear kinematic hardening can be modeled using classical plagues plasticity, despite the common belief, again, from the 70s or the 80s. They could mo model large strain cyclic, cyclic hyperelastoplasticity using elastic correctors, bypassing uh, the classical multiplicative decomposition of Lyon from 2010. They could uh, develop the first of its kind, plain stress projected algorithm employing the multiplicative decomposition. Remarkably, this was uh, very good to, to be able to, to read it. it was, uh, they could integrate plasticity, viscoplasticity, and viscoelasticity within a common framework, which I think is remarkable. And finally, even more remarkable is that this formulation can be extended to model finite strain crystal, crystal plasticity. In this case, challenging other well-established formulations, in this case from the 90s. So we have now a general a common formulation that is applicable to both continuum and multi-scale problems. And uh, well, we, with that, I finish also this part. So let's hear the references for this part. So you can come back later. And finally, I will, let's move on to last part of this presentation, which is computational growth and remodeling. This is part of the work that I perform at Yale. Here I'm showing only results that are related to the computational part of, of uh, this inelastic theory. <clears throat> but before that, I would like to, to show you a couple of sentences that I have pulled out from this page from Stanford, where they also, they have also a SIMOA award, but it's for PhD uh, thesis students. And, uh, they say that by the time Huang came to Stanford in 1995, he had already made fundamental progress in computational approaches to problems of solids and structures undergoing inelastic deformation, as I have reviewed previously. In the process, he had established himself as a star. Juan died in 1994 at the age of 42 only, leaving us a legacy, some 80 publications, and three books that continue to be highly cited. So, and then they, they finish saying that one can only guess at the marvels he would have produced had he been able to continue. So it turns out that related to growth and remodeling, uh, in the early 90s, uh, the early 90s, he was already collaborating with Jacobs at Stanford, uh, developing computational models for bone remodeling in this case. And there is a, even another paper. Uh, so yes, absolutely, I, I agree. I, I also guess what marvels he will have produced in this field had he been able to continue. Probably we will have now a second part of this book, Computational Elasticity, or even a third part, who knows. So, but without that part available, I will now review uh, also some approaches to growth and remodeling and how can they be computed uh, in finite elements. So by the time I arrive at jail, and uh, I have a, I had a couple of meetings with Jay Humphrey. Then I, I soon realized that to model soft tissue growth and remodeling required a, a different approach, an approach more based on micromechanics than my, macro mechanics. And I, I will explain that in this slide. So soft tissues known to comprise diverse cell, diverse cell types, extracellular matrix constituent, each of which can possess individual natural configurations, material properties, and rates of turnover. So for example, taking, taking the arterial wall, we can only consider the load bearing constituents, for example, elastin, platin, 
and the bus muscle. And in this model, we consider that they are deposited uh, within the arterial wall for given pre-stretch. Well, elastin is uh, what uh, provides elasticity to the wall, but from a GNR perspective, it is produced, organized, and cross-linked early in life. The mean lifetime or the half-life is uh, about 50 years. For example, uh, and then collagen that provides strength to the wall continuously turn over in maturity with a mean lifetime of just one month. So now assume that we want to construct or build a model to describe the growth and remodeling of this, uh, of this artery, arterial wall, in, and we take one month as a reference. So we want to see how this has growth in, in one month, has grown in one month. So for one month, because the half-life of elastin is 50 years, of course, elastin is not degraded or is, is that's negligible. So we must assume that the, or take that the behavior of elastin is elastic over one month. However, for collagen, we should model it with a GNR model. So you can see here the difference with, for example, viscoelasticity, where we can also assume, or take uh, the, the arterial wall as a mixture of constituents, but if we want to model viscoelasticity, the fiber will be viscoelastic, and the mat matrix will be vis viscoelastic. So the behavior can be homogenized easily, and we get an homogeneous viscoelastic material. However, here, different constituents have, over time, different constitutive behavior. So here, it's not that obvious that we can uh, homogenize the behavior. Of course, we can do it, but it's not that obvious. Indeed, there are two different theories. Well, there are more theories, but there are two main theories to study soft tissue growth in the modeling. What is finite volumetric growth theory developed in 94 by Rodriguez and uh, colleagues, and the constraint mixture theory developed by Humphrey and Rachel in 2002. And there are many, many differences between these two models. First, this is a macromechanical model, homogenized, while this is micromechanical model based on a mixture of constituents. This is mechanobiologically motivated, this is kinematically motivated, and in this, this motivation comes or leads to, to a multiplicative decomposition similar to the ones I have reviewed previously for viscoelasticity or plasticity. However, the multiplicative decomposition for the constraint mixture model is a little bit more complicated, but takes into account that the constituents are being deposited over the past history and then evolve with the, with the mixture. But there are other differences, but from a modeling point of view or computational point of view, this question gives rise to an integral type evolution question, not only for stress, but also for mass and uh, also for the, all the constituents that uh, constitute the mixture. Well, this, this or uses a right type evolution question only for mass growth. So what is the difference? So that this is computationally very expensive and this is computationally very efficient. That's the main reason why this formulation has prevailed in the community, particularly if we want to perform computational uh, analysis. However, in 2016, uh, well, and I will say that, however, uh, my opinion, this model has the, the minimum amount of ingredients that are needed to model soft tissue GNR satisfactorily. And I will show that later. But in order to increase or improve computational expensive, Christian Siron et al. in 2016, they homogenized all these integrals, which means that basically they converted an integral type evolution equation in a rate type evolution equation for mass and stress. So this formulation is now computationally efficient and comparable to the finite volumetric growth. However, what I want to remark here is that this, all of these models are rate dependent. And this can be seen from the evolution equation for mass. So we can compare to viscoelasticity, and you can see now that they are pretty similar. And here I'm introducing the stimulus function. So you can see that for stimulus function, upsilon, greater than one, then there will be growth because this term will be greater than this. For a stimulus function less than one, this there will be negative growth. And, but here, what I want to show is the characteristic time for the GNR process. Here, this is a simple simulation for which I increase pressure and then this value is sustained over time. So you can see how for 20 days, 
that is prescribed, we get a characteristic time for GNR response, which is of the same order. So then this for, will be for a mixture of people. However, this similarity was already seen or acknowledged by, for example, Cohen in 2004, who said that there is a the similarity between models of GNR and models of viscoelasticity. And here I want you to uh, show that for now and low, slow processes, of course, we need a viscoelastic model for precise modeling. However, we know that for the relaxed solution, this, this solution, which we get the same final solution, can be performed more easily and efficiently with a hyperelastic model. So we, we get exactly the same solution, as you can see. So, but then when I was at Yale, I saw that this, and because I had experience in viscoelasticity, that uh, there was something missing here in the puzzle of, of models. In, the, in this seminal paper about Cohen or this book by Gorelli, they consider that GNR time is the, uh, the longest time. However, there are cases in which GNR might be even slower. And that is, for example, consider a case of gradual hypertension. Where there is an increase in pressure, but that is slow. Or aging, or the expansion of an aneurysm via losses of elastic fiber integrity. But this can take years. So here, one year is, of course, longer than two weeks. So then I realized that there was something missing. So what happens if this time Characteristic time for the stimulus is greater than that for growth at the moment. So we have, we know that for viscoelasticity, we have hyperelasticity, viscoplasticity, elastoplasticity. But what happens with growth and remodeling? There was not a model for rate independent GNR. Indeed, you can see that the, the name, we, we have to use another name. So this is just rate independent. So if there are situations for which this is satisfied, we have a rate independent solution. So for then I saw, okay, so what, what can we do? So we can this do, we can do this formally. So for the evolution of mass density, this is the time dependent equation from a constraint mixture model. We can assume an equilibrium solution, pre-integrate, and we get this time independent equation. So now we have converted an integral equation into an algebraic equation. And now we see here a similarity between plasticity between the yield function and the rate independent GNR. So this looks like plasticity. However, if, if we do the same for the stress, we uh, assume equilibrium solution, pre-integrate, we obtain a time independent equation that now depends on the deformation gradient only. So this is not similar to plasticity, this is similar to Cauchy elasticity. So this is, uh, rate independent GNR is not plasticity. It's not either Cauchy elasticity, of course. But now we could, with this, we could develop a model that was computationally very efficient because we removed the integrals completely. Indeed, this rule of mixtures that I showed before that depends on the deformation gradient, we can now consider the consistency condition, I'll obtain an expression for stresses that depend directly on strains or the deformation. So we get a formulation for GNR without internal variables. So you can imagine that this is computationally very convenient. Indeed, the consistent tangent is exactly the continuum tangent. So this is not similar to plasticity. Indeed, there is no need to integral, integrate internal variables. We can use hyperelastic like material user subroutines. There is no volumetric locking because volume is computed as part of the solution. And here I just increased 50% in pressure to on artery. And we can see that the time, computational time, is comparable to hyperelasticity and also the, the rate of convergence. And here, just wanted to compare with plasticity that we have to be consistent with the linearization. And here, just a few examples, and I finish. So, with this, we can now uh, compute the slow enlargement of aneurysms where the rate dependent effects are negligible. So, we don't need here to use a rate dependent. Uh, theory is uh, is just we, we can compute it with a rate independent. This is what I'm showing here for different properties that have been compromised. If, uh, for example, arterial tortuosity, if we assume that this is low and it is indeed, the, we can also compute it using this formulation very efficiently. I can tell you that simulations of this type take one or two minutes only. This can be compared also to experiments. 
And here, this has been explained by others as an elastic instability. We showed in this paper, we got a collaboration with Darways and Christina Cabinetto at the Jane Humphreys lab, that this can be understood as a mechanobiological bulking instability. And finally, another application where this formulation can be useful is for tissue engineered vascular rafts for newborns, for example, for newborns uh, born with a single ventricle heart, where the slow degradation of the polymer scaffold induces autologous tissue regeneration. Well, if this polymer degrades slowly, we can also use this formulation to compute, to see how the neo tissue forms, okay, from blue to red, while the, the polymer degrades. We could also couple this with a 1D equation for the fluids. And this was very interesting uh, collaboration with um, Jason Saffron and Haidt uh, Machandra, of course, uh, So then we could compare with uh, the experimental data. We see the thickening of the TVG, narrowing, and also an axial shrinking that is all of them are predicted by the model. So these are the references for this part. Let's finish with just two take, uh, take home messages. So it's regarding modeling in elastic solids based on the multiplicative decomposition. I suggest that you don't go with the inelastic flow, just go with the elastic recoil. And for when modeling soft tissue GNR, remember that a turtle is slower than a cheetah, but of course it is faster that the planet's name. So with this, I finish. And uh, I think that I'll take, I took all the time. Thank you so much, uh, Marcos. Uh, very impressive and, of course, interesting uh, talk. Uh, first of all, congratulations. Uh, also for your birthday. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know if uh, there is any question in the, in the chat. Uh, but uh, in the meanwhile, uh, I have uh, one one question. I uh, I was back uh, uh, attending to your to your lecture. I was uh, transporting my, myself back to the to my early times uh, as a pre-doctoral uh, researcher, in which uh, I, I was uh, introduced to the same uh, book of uh, Juan Carlos Simó by my advisor, uh, Professor Manuel de Blaret. And uh, I was uh, remembering that uh, good times. And um, I was uh, surprised with the last part of your talk uh, by, by the, the, the parallelism, the comparison you made between growth and remodeling and uh, viscoelasticity. Uh, because uh, by that time, my uh, my mate, uh, doctoral uh, student, uh, who is now professor like me in, here in the department, uh, Jose Manuel Garcia Aznar, was developing a, a model of uh, remodeling based on plasticity, as you may as you may know. So, uh, yeah. what's uh, the, the 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 main uh, advantage? Uh, maybe the, the lack of uh, of internal variables that you that you mentioned uh, before. Uh, I mean, in, in com yeah. with comparison in between a uh, viscoelasticity-like approach to remodeling and a plasticity-like or damage-like approach to, to remodeling. Yes, yeah, so compared to rate-dependent uh, formulation or viscoelasticity-like formulation, the main gain is in computational time, of course. This is, this is what, I, what I try to explain with this slide, right? Is that if the, if the process is slow, of course, this rate independent DNR formulation is only valid for very, very slow processes as I showed. In the general case, we should use a rate dependent formulation. But it's just that for these slow cases, no one, for example, in viscoelasticity, this is comparable as viscoelasticity to hyperelasticity, right? So in this case, no one should compute this response using a viscoelastic model. It can be done, but it's, we are engineers and we should not do this. So to compute this response, we should use a hyperelastic model, right? It's, uh, for me, this is like, uh, 
as we say in Spain, is uh, matar una mosca, cañonazos, no? <laughs> <laughs> like shooting a fly with a, a cannon. Uh, but we should use the, the model that is made to, to solve this problem, not another one. So that's the same for GNR. We have very slow processes, as here, I'm showing here. All of this, they can be, here, rate-dependent effects are, can be negligible at, uh, to a first approximation, right? So, but should we use a rate-dependent model? We can do this with a rate-independent model. And so, and as you said, comparing, there are other models that are rate-independent, but here I wanted to say that this is the first uh, rate-independent constraint mixture model. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Compared to the other models, if they are based on plasticity, perhaps the main difference is that this is based on a mixture of constituents uh, rather than an homoge homogenized material. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was uh, having a look at the uh, YouTube uh, chat where uh, I see no questions, only only uh, congratulation messages. Oh, okay. uh, people is uh, impressed by by the quality of the of, the, of your talk. Oh, but, uh, there is no no question so far. So, well, Marcos, in the interest of time, because uh, as you yes. know, we have our annual general assembly of our society. I I truly and warmly uh, thank you for. Uh, well, for the prize, for your career, I'm happy as a Spanish uh, member of the community to, to have you back to Spain. And uh, well, we, we hope to, to meet uh, in particular in our uh, conference in, in Las Palmas uh, next yes. year. Hopefully mm -hmm. uh, everything uh, will, uh, will go well with this uh, pandemic and uh, we will be able to, to meet uh, all the community together in, in Las Palmas in, in September and to have the opportunity to, to give you the, the, your, your award as a Juan Carlos Simo awardee of uh, our uh, society. So again, congratulations and thank you for, uh, for this uh, wonderful uh, lecture today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Elias. I, 